Good evening and welcome to Eagle Eye News. I'm Keith Campbell. And I'm Kara Rhodes. The Auburn Police Division is investigating a homicide that occurred Saturday evening on South Dean Road. Officers responded to a call at an apartment complex where they found 26-year-old Herman Cornelius Lane dead inside his residence from a gunshot wound. When a friend of Lane's could not reach him by phone, he went to his apartment where he found Lane and called 911. Lane's body has been taken to forensic sciences for a post-mortem exam. The homicide investigation is still ongoing. If you have any information, contact the Lee County Secret Witness Quarters Office at 334-745-8686. Alabama's prison system has been facing disputes and lawmakers are working to make some changes. Eagle Eye reporter Ken Ward has more. Overcrowding, staffing shortages, and violence, three things that have been facing Alabama's prison system for decades. Currently a proposal in the Alabama legislature aimed at changing that trend. I think the, really the question for the state is um, what type of correction systems do you want to run? Um, the one we currently have uh, has been based on an, about a 1970s, 1980s model. Uh, it's been neglected uh, financially for many, many years. And many of the problems that we're seeing creep up right now are uh, as a result of the decades of, of neglect, in my judgment. The plan, sponsored by Senator Cam Ward and supported by Governor Bentley, along with corrections officials, aims at replacing Alabama's current prisons with four state-of-the-art new buildings, all with the hope of reducing the problems currently facing the system. The bill that Senator Ward is uh, sponsoring and that we're supporting vigorously uh, is an opportunity to bring the Alabama Department of Corrections into the 21st century. The current plan calls for the state to borrow over $800 million to fund the construction, money that supporters of the bill and corrections officials say will be paid back with savings and better efficiencies within the prison system. Corrections budget forecast for the next uh, 30 years, the state's going to spend approximately $18 billion on corrections uh, in the next 30 years. And what we're asking is to be able to take this $800 million and repurpose some of that eight, uh, $18 billion to redo our infrastructure. And we'll be able to pay for that within our own budget. Not all lawmakers and elected officials agree with the proposal, though, including several members of the governor's own party. They say there are better ways of dealing with the long-term problems facing the state's correction system. The governor's plan would put the state in debt for $800 million. When the interest charges are paid, it will be $1.5 billion debt over a 30-year period of time. At the same time, it will not solve the prison problem. State Auditor Jim Ziegler, an outspoken opponent to the governor's plan, has made a new plan he calls Plan Z, which he says would require the state to take out an only $123 million bond issue. For a $123 million bond issue compared to $800 million, you could build a new women's prison, which is where serious problems are, and then that cost $100 million. And then for $23 million, refurbish the old Tuckwiler facility, which is the current women's prison, as a new men's prison. And in this way, you can solve the problem without an $800 million indebtedness. Even though there's some opposition, Governor Bentley still believes new prisons will be built in the state. I think that we presented a very good plan, and uh, we will let it now work through the process and, and work through the, the Senate uh, first, probably, and then it will go, I think, to the House. But uh, we'll just see what uh, comes out, and, uh, you know, we are going to build prisons. No matter which plan is passed, most elected officials agree something must be done to help improve corrections in Alabama. Ken Ward, Eagle Eye TV. The governor's bill is still in committee and is expected to be modified. Auburn University is named Mike Clarity the Assistant Vice President for Communications and Marketing following a national search. Clarity has been serving as the interim president or the interim in this position since 2015 and we begin the new position immediately. Clarity will be responsible for the development of marketing strategies for the university and will oversee news writing, website design, social media, photography, broadcast video, and advertising. He will also serve as an instructor in the School of Communication and Journalism. Alabama's food industry supports hundreds of jobs and contributes millions to the state's economy. Industry officials and lawmakers gathered Wednesday to remind Alabamians to buy local. Ken Ward has more. Business and government leaders gathered on the grounds of the state capitol Wednesday to advocate for Alabama-made products and to promote the Buy Alabama's Best campaign. 
Well, we, the Alabama's best was in conception was several years ago. A group of like-minded individuals got together and decided that there's a, there's a big need for the consumers to understand which products are made and, and produced here in Alabama. And we wanted to kind of get the word out. The campaign is a collaborative effort between local grocery stores and food businesses aimed at supporting Alabama-made products. Alabama-based company ourselves, uh, Mitchell Grocery, and, and we have a number of retailers, a number of retail stores. So promoting Alabama products is key for us. Uh, uh, one, it's local. Two, it's familiarity in, the, in all the products. Uh, people like, like homegrown. They like hometown. Products ranging from ice cream to soda were all spotlighted as leaders spoke about how important shopping locally and supporting local companies is to Alabama's economy. And I think that one of the things we need to make sure we're more committed to is ensuring the success of our local organizations and operations that are committed to our counties and our community. Governor Bentley used the occasion to advocate for one of his key proposals this year, eliminating the state's sales tax on groceries. We want to make sure that we take 4% off of uh, our, our food, food products in this state uh, because I think that'll help uh, especially people on fixed income and middle income people with children and even lower income people who don't qualify for federal assistance. Uh, I just think taking 4% off of food is something that we really need to do in this state. Campaign organizers and elected officials hope the increased attention will help Alabamians realize the important contributions local businesses have to the state's overall economy. Reporting for Montgomery, Ken Ward, Eagle Eye TV. You can learn more about the Buy Alabama's Best initiative by visiting buyalabamasbest.com. And coming up, Katie Bay Hafer gives a look at last week's Red Barn series and tells us why you may already be looking into a retirement home. You're watching Eagle Eye TV on Channel 6. I hope that you've been able to learn a strong work ethic surrounded by character, integrity, perseverance, so that when your one second comes, you'll be prepared for it. Chris Davis. 45, there goes Davis. Your one second, our one second is now. And our lives have been guided by the principles of one of the greatest academic institutions in the country, Auburn University. Entertainment. If you're interested in learning the art of calligraphy, your chance is this week. This Thursday evening, University Programs Council will be hosting a calligraphy workshop in the Student Center Ballroom. Students will have the opportunity to learn the popular art trade from a professional hand lettering artist. To reserve your spot, you can RSVP on AU Involve. Camp War Eagle, Sodexo, and Chartwells will be hosting the 17th annual Flapjack Fest this Wednesday at 6. The event will also hold a silent auction with the proceeds benefiting the Ryan Chandler Memorial Scholarship Endowment. Tickets are $5 cash only. You can get your ticket on the concourse until Wednesday afternoon at 2. The event will take place in Foy Hall Food Court. Today, Aerie came to Auburn's campus. The pop-up shop parked outside on the student center green space allowed students to stop in between classes for spring break apparel. Their digital influencer, Iskra Lawrence, also made an appearance. The shop is open again tomorrow from 11 to 5. Minto Communities announced that they will be opening a chain of Jimmy Buffett-inspired Margaritaville Senior Living Communities. The singer's namesake company is already known for restaurants, hotels, and vacation resorts centered around the island lifestyle. This $1 billion project will create 7,000 homes with beachfront access and will be golf cart friendly. The vice president of Minto Community said that they expect our first residents to be living in the community by late summer. Residents must be aged, quote, 55 and better to register. Auburn University Program Council hosted the Red Barn Series this past weekend. Auburn UPC put on the Red Barn Series March 2nd and 3rd. Local musicians came out and played, bringing the Auburn community together while listeners enjoyed a warm cup of coffee on a cool evening. Well, the vibes that we kind of go with for this event are like coffee shop, like kind of hipster. Um, I don't know. It's just really kind of like 
We try to appeal to a smaller part of campus. We have major entertainment as one of our committees, and they apply to like, you know, this huge part of campus. And we kind of want to pinpoint those people that may not enjoy that big concert. This is kind of more like, you know, casual guitar, maybe a drum set, acoustic, that kind of thing. I had the unique opportunity to talk to Virginia Bolton, a freshman at Auburn, about why she was so excited to hear tonight's headliner. Um, I'm so excited because my brother is actually in one of the bands playing. There. Uh, his band is called the Brook and the Bluff, um, and so I always go out to his events when he comes and plays. The Red Barn series featured the Brook and the Bluff, Caroline Jackson, Unit 10, and a few other local musicians. UPC also hosts monthly open mic nights in the Student Center Starbucks to highlight talented singer-songwriters on our campus. For more entertainment news, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Eagle Eye TV. Also, tune into The Scoop Wednesdays at 3 right here on Eagle Eye TV. Up next, Chris Hummel will update us on the latest in Auburn sports. You're watching Eagle Eye TV, Channel 6. This is a place where it only takes a second to imagine your future. Grasp a new concept in class. Inspire a child's curiosity. Discover a real world solution. Seize an unexpected opportunity. This is where you gain the preparation, confidence, and determination to succeed. This is Auburn. I hope that you've been able to learn a strong work ethic surrounded by character, integrity, perseverance, so that when your one second comes, you'll be prepared for it. Chris Davis. 45, there goes Davis. Your one second, our one second is now. And our lives have been guided by the principles of one of the greatest academic institutions in the country, Auburn University. Men's basketball is traveling to the SEC tournament. Baseball and softball had a big weekend, and we have an update for you on fantasy sports. I'm Chris Hummel, and this is Eagle Eye Sports. Men's basketball closed out the regular season Saturday night in the Auburn Arena. The team faced Missouri, defeating them 89-78. to Auburn swept the series and finished the season with 18 wins. It was great to see our seniors um, lead us to victory. I thought all three of them were engaged, um, particularly T.J. Dunnans, um, you know, demonstrating what he can do, the impact he can have in a game with his four steals and, and, and some of the plays that he made. And, um, and you could tell... The, the team fed off of him and obviously felt really good about the way he played with a little bit of freedom and and um, he played hard. Um, I just came up just trying to have fun, play my um, best game, my best home, last home game. So I was just trying to have fun pretty much. Um, we knew last game they out-rebounded us, so that was the main point, just try to um, like just not let it happen again. That's the only reason that um, it was a close game last time because we got out-rebounded. We know we play them again. Uh, in, uh, on Wednesday. It's tough to beat a good team three times. Um, and there'll be a lot to prepare for. We'll have to, um, we did a lot of things that we thought we needed to do to win this game today. We didn't hold a lot back. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to break this one down and see what else we got that we can, that we can do to be effective. Um, for them to just come out hard, you know, we gotta come harder. You know, we can't be lax when we go out there, so we just, we gotta prepare. I think um, it's not it's not what they're gonna do. It's what we're gonna do. If we're gonna is we're gonna play defense. Like if we're gonna play defense consistently, if everybody gonna come down, and rebound, help the bids out. Up next, Auburn plays Missouri again this Wednesday in the SEC tournament. Tip off is at 8:30 in Bridgestone Arena in Nashville, Tennessee. The softball team shut out the Liberty Flames Friday night. The bats were alive early for Auburn as they scored 15 runs in the first two innings against Liberty University Thursday night. Carly Wallace and Haley Fagan got things started for the Tigers, hitting first inning home runs. Following the Fagan home run, Liberty University sent Chase Cassidy to the circle. Liberty would have four different pitchers pitch in this game, but Auburn was able to continue to score seven runs in the first inning. After Liberty was unable to answer to the Auburn scoring in the second inning, the Tigers came back to the plate and added eight more runs. 
Kennel Beach and Casey Cooper both hit home runs in the second inning. All nine stars for the Tigers scored in this game, which is the first time this has happened since the May 22, 2016 game against Jacksonville State. After the second inning, Liberty was able to keep the Tigers scoreless, but that wasn't enough. Auburn's Ashley Swindle and Jenna Abbott came to the circle and were able to keep Liberty off the scoreboard. Auburn would go on to defeat Liberty 15-0. Auburn and Liberty will be facing off again Friday night at 6 o'clock at Jane B. Moore Field. In Auburn, Meredith Brito, Eagle Eye Sports. The Tigers finished out the weekend in the Wilson D. Marini Classic, winning all four games. In the latest rankings released today, Auburn remained at the number two spot in the nation. Auburn baseball is focused and on fire. The Tigers hosted Lipscomb for a three-game series at Plainsman Park. Auburn recorded two wins against Lipscomb to begin the series, but fell 8-7 to seven in 10 innings in the final game Sunday. In the first game, Auburn shut out Lipscomb, giving the team its fifth shutout win this season, which also leads the NCAA. They will, go, they will go to bat next with South Alabama on Tuesday in Plainsman Park. The number 18 Auburn gymnastics team traveled to Missouri for the last SEC meet of this season. Auburn lost in another close score to Missouri. Up next, Auburn returns to the Auburn Arena for the last game of the season when they host Pittsburgh Friday night. Online fantasy sports could soon be legal in the state of Alabama. DraftKings and FanDuel are two daily fantasy sports apps that are currently illegal in Alabama. Three separate bills are currently pending in the Alabama legislature that would allow Alabamians to play online daily fantasy sports again. Want more sports updates throughout the week? We've got you covered. Just like us on Facebook at Eagle Eye TV and catch Tiger Tally every Monday. Now let's catch up with Kennedy McKnight who will give us a look into this week's weather. You're watching Eagle Eye TV on Channel 6. Thank you, Chris. I'm Kennedy, and I'm here with this week's weather. All right, looking at tomorrow, you're going to have low 60s tomorrow morning, but by afternoon, you're going to see high 60s, maybe some low 70s peeking through, and in the evening, you'll end with some mid 60s. Looking at this week, you're going to see Tuesday tomorrow, we're going to have some rain, storms, but thankfully Wednesday and Thursday, it's going to clear up and you'll have some sun. But sadly, we'll end this week with some raining and storming, so hopefully next week it'll be a little sunnier. All right, looking at Auburn tomorrow, we're going to have rain here, looking at Columbus, rain, and sadly in Montgomery, we're going to have rain, so it's not looking too happy tomorrow for the weather down here in the south. And looking at next week for spring break, happy weather down in Panama City and Destin and in Miami, but sadly up in Savannah and Myrtle Beach, we're going to have a little bit of rain, so I hope no one plans to go there this spring break. And all right, we're going to send y'all back to the news desk for some more headlines. President Donald Trump signed a new executive order Monday that bans immigration from six Muslim-majority countries. The new list excludes Iraq. The country's removal from the list came after an intense review from the State Department to improve vetting of Iraqi citizens in collaboration with the Iraqi government. The new ban takes effect March 16th. And President Gooch released a statement to students informing them that it doesn't impact Auburn students already in the U.S. Under this revised executive order, Auburn students from the countries listed in the executive order aren't automatically banned from returning to campus after traveling outside the U.S. Over 300 companies are already lining up to build the U.S.-Mexico border wall. Businesses will be asked to submit their proposals for designs within this next week and expects to award the initial contracts in April. Trump signed an executive order his first week in office, which put plans for the wall in motion, although Congress approval for spending will be needed before actual construction of the wall can begin. Trump has said that the entire wall will cost $10 billion, but some other estimates have put it as much as $25 billion. The Supreme Court on Monday sent a case involving a transgender high school student back to a lower court, which was a temporary setback for the student. The lower court decision is for the case of Gavin Grimm, a Virginia student seeking to use bathrooms that align with his gender identity. The lower court decision means that this case will most likely remove the possibility that the Supreme Court will hear the case this term. This decision comes in the wake of a change in policy by the Trump administration. 
That's all that we have for you tonight. Tune in after the show for a live look in of the SGA Senate meeting and keep up with all of the latest Auburn news throughout the week by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Eagle Eye TV. I'm Kara Rhodes. And I'm Keith Gamble. Thanks for joining us in War Eagle. War Eagle.